Uh, in the first, <laughs> am I a mean distinguished like the series? So we'll start. So in the 1970s, the ME chair, Dr. James John, was my advisor, graduate advisor at the University of Maryland, and he brought me here. I didn't interview like most faculty in that. He said, I want him to come with me. Then after five years, he decided to leave and he became the ME chair at Ohio State. And as it turns out, I became the chair. What are some of the changes that occurred during my tenure here? Of course, we made contacts with respect to our program for senior research associates, the UT NASA employee, where these individuals are funded by, by NASA and they work on site there. Uh, so we made a lot of contacts that way over, over the 45 years of uh, funding for that program. As far as our department goes, a major thing with our department is getting accredited. And the first accreditation that I've ever knew of was when I was the chair. That was the first time we've received six years. And the good news is that we have received six years forever since then, which is a tremendous accomplishment. Our students are special uh, because they have to complete at least three mandatory co-ops. This uh, gives them an edge when it comes to employment. They are one of the highest earners among all Ohio public universities. And also, uh, they get a lot of intelligence when it comes to their own education. I definitely think the co-op program is going to increase like the, the well-roundedness of my education because getting that real-world experience is so valuable. I have participated in the organization of Association of MIME Graduate Students. This organization allows me to interact with others, expand my network, and gain leadership skills. I'm working with the company Eaton and Lincoln Electric. They have a DOD project that um, they're testing a couple different materials. I have to see the fatigue life of those materials. And then once I break those materials, I get to do fractography, um, some microscopy of the, of the grain structure, and uh, we did tensile tests also. What we do in this lab is a particular type of failure, which is called fatigue failure. Again, something that is kind of unique about my research lab here, even in United States, are these two new machines that we have. Only three schools in the U.S. have this ultrasonic fatigue tester. We can uniquely test at high temperature, as I said, for air jet engine applications. We have a couple of projects, one with the U.S. Air Force, one with Eaton. Uh, also, we have some, again, uh, inter-school uh, collaboration overseas in Austria and also a couple of schools here in the United States, University of uh, North Florida, Auburn University, and Iowa State University. How do I see the department moving forward for the next generation of students? We have been trying to answer this question is by listening to two very important group of constituents. We have a student advisory group, and we have an industrial advisory group. Um, in the first, we try to go across and look at students who are in their first year, second year, and as well as last year. And this group of students, because of the mandatory co-op that we have, uh, come back with a lot of intelligence. They know what they're missing in their graduate, in their degrees, and what, where we can do better. Our industrial advisory board also are uh, people who either hire our students at co-op or will be future employer of our students. Uh, so we listen to this two uh, advisory group in a systematic way. We meet them at least once a year. And because of these interactions, we have created programs in areas of mechatronics, uh, in the area of advanced manufacturing, as well as in the area of material science and engineering. Uh, we see these areas as areas that mechanical engineers uh, would need uh, to develop further expertise. Uh, so we now have concentration for our mechanical engineering students. They, they can graduate with a mechanical engineering degree 
but it, with a concentration in mechatronics, for example. UT has a lot of really amazing resources. Being able to like plug into so many different student organizations and having so many different, very knowledgeable professors to talk to is, is pretty valuable for me. MIME genuinely cares about the advancement and development of uh, its students. So when Ted crossed this very important line of 50 years of service at the University of Toledo, we thought hard how we can make a lasting legacy of recognition for, for Ted that at least comes to, uh, very close uh, to the accomplishment that he had. So instead of having a single ceremony and handing Ted a flag and appreciating his efforts, we came up with the idea that was mostly his of creating yet another um, entity within the department, which is this distinguished lecture scheme. Our hope is to make a sustainable event that happens every year and brings world-class researchers and leaders from academia and industry that would connect with our students and with our community and this way and reverberate the impact that had had over the years, for many years uh, to come. So this is a, an attribute uh, to uh, Dr. Keith. And uh, uh, coming to our speaker and speaking of, of other giants, I'll have the pleasure of having our dean. Uh, dean too introduced our speaker. Our uh, dean too, before coming to University of Toledo, served in many important positions in the industry and academia, including serving an associate dean uh, at Bucknell University. He graduated with a PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as his master's degree, as well as his undergraduate degree. With that, let's welcome Dr. Thank you very much, uh, it's a privilege of me, Dr. Hawking, and Dr. Hawking yesterday. I'll introduce them in just a second. But when I think of successful people, uh, especially in the academy, they, they usually have maybe two or three out of four things. First of all, credentials that help. Not only that, sorry, but that helps. Uh, secondly, it's kind of a breadth of intellect that lets you go a little beyond your maybe degrees in your own discipline to understand and make contributions to other disciplines around you. Uh, awards are often part of it. And then the fourth one is people want to work with you. And uh, so that applies very much to Dr. Ted Heath. It's been my pleasure when I think of what he has achieved, as Dr. Allen, you said, over 50 years, 43, let me get it right, 43 master's students and 34 PhD students, lots of people. Who here got a graduate degree under Dr. Heath? Because I know there's a couple in the audience. Very good. That's part of his legacy. And again, he's done some wonderful things on this. So those four things, uh, credentials, breadth of intellect, awards, and people want to work, fits very well with our VIP speaker today, our normal speaker, Dr. Ryan Sullivan. So he has uh, credentials, bachelor's, all the chemical engineering, all the degrees, Northwestern, an excellent university, and then a master's and PhD uh, from the uh, Berkeley, which is 
we now deciding what they call the panel and earlier, <laughs> still figuring that one out. Done a postdoc before at Harvard MIT. Uh, so his credentials are very good. And Brett the Binlap is showing here on the screen. So mechanical engineering, uh, but look at he's also affiliated with bioengineering and placed some leadership roles there. So again, that breadth of intellect that has taken him, I think, and I bet you will sense that breadth of intellect in his remarks today. As far as the awards, like many, almost expected, but still a chief and notable NSF career award, also a career award from the Journal of the Institute of Physics, Journal of Micromechanics and Microengineering. He's also gotten other awards, such as the Outstanding, IEEE Outstanding Student Paper Award and the Guild Ed Workshop Best Paper Award. And then the last part, and there's other awards too, but I won't go on too many, but it's on his website. I encourage you to stalk him there and you'll be even more impressed. And as far as people wanting to work with him, a couple signs of it. First of all, he just got tenure just this year. Congratulations for that. And yet he has three postdocs and 10 PhD students and some master's students, all part of his research group. And so I know Dr. Keith had that big group, and certainly Dr. Ellie Hankins still does, but that's really a testament to him. And the other thing is, we talked yesterday and enjoyed it. I was trying to get a sense for how do you, how do you, you know, encourage our faculty to be a successful Dr. Sokol. And I was under talking to him about his proposal writing experiences. And he's at the point now, he says, I, I really don't write proposals. People come to me, they offer me money, I take it, and then I deliver it then. So that's a really nice way to go through life. So we could uh, maybe learn from him there. So anyway, we are so pleased, so honored to have as our inaugural speaker today, Dr. Ryan Sokol. Please welcome him. I still have proposals, uh, just maybe not as many as when I first got to school, um, when I first became a professor. But uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind of introduction, and uh, thank you, Dr. Keith and, and Sandra. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, also showing us around Toledo and getting to go to the art exam together and dinner. Uh, and it ends up being like I know this is like part of my job, I guess, but it's an incredible job if you get to you know do activities like this and, and meet great people. Uh, so, hi everyone. So, I'm Ryan Sokol. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland College Park, and I have some fun stuff to talk to you, but I think it's fun. So, uh, let's see what it is. But, um, all right, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background. So, uh, actually, I did my undergraduate in the Midwest, so not, not too far from here at uh, Northwestern and a little north of Chicago. Uh, I also did a co op program. So, uh, Northwestern has one, not as, uh, it's definitely more volunteer ish uh, compared to here, but I got a chance to work at a spinoff report called Bistion that actually got reabsorbed back into Ford. And uh, it was a really important experience for me. Uh, maybe not, not, like, well, you'll see. Not exactly the best way. But uh, it was really cool because I, I joined in the early 2000s. And so I don't know if you remember what the, the Ford Mustang used to look like in the late 90s. But in my view, like, not that attractive a car. But then, is it, is your microphone on? And it says yes. Maybe I'll just close it here. How's that a little better? All right. All right. So, uh, so uh, I got a chance to work on it in 2000, 2003 was the redesign of the Ford Mustang for this 2005 new launch. And so, my particular role was, was in the advanced axle work division. And basically, my job was that when I first came in, there's a particular test you could run the axle through. The, the original axle when I got there was lasting 20,000 cycles. But the government standard, the only thing you have to pass to be able to sell this car is 10,000 cycles. So my job was basically to redesign it so we're only lasting for 10,000 cycles, right? Now, logically, this makes sense, right? So if your whole car is designed, let's say, break down at 500,000 miles, you don't need some random part to last for over a million miles, right? That, that doesn't make any sense. It's not optimized engineering. But on an emotional level, this really messed with me. The idea that, like, if you work, if you bought the car after I worked on it, objectively it's a little worse. Even though, you know, theoretically, obviously, it's better. You know, it's all optimized engineering. But um, waking up every day was a little bit rough for me, and so I ended up, uh, you know, deciding that I wanted to kind of go a different route. You know, could I do something different with the hand measuring principles that I had learned? And so that led to me basically going to UC Berkeley and pursuing a graduate degree of trying to apply mechanical engineering methods to biological or biomedical applications. And so uh, during that time, I learned a lot about 
microfabrication and micromachining. But then I had an opportunity to work as a visiting postdoc at the University of Tokyo. And that was my first experience with, with really true micro and nanoscale 3D printing. And from there, I really grew to appreciate the geometric versatility of that technology and how that can be used. And that led to me moving to Harvard MIT and trying to use some of those technologies to build kidney on chip systems. Uh, but then quickly after, I was able to move to uh, Dr. Keith's old apartment at the University of Maryland College Park and start my own group where we pursue a number of applications related to micro and nanoscale 3D printing. But today, I'm definitely going to be talking a lot about our soft robotics group. So I think in terms of robotics, when most people hear the word robot, usually they're thinking of something like this, right? So we're talking about rigid materials, things like metals or hard plastics, and these are usually actuated using electronic control schemes, typically. And this has a lot of benefits for certain applications, but there are also areas where that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so as a result, there's kind of been this new area of robotics that's referred to as soft robotics. And these are systems that use what are referred to as compliant materials and soft materials and soft body systems. And often they're actuated using fluidic means, so such as you know, the pneumatics or hydraulics. And they have a number of benefits in terms of adaptability, being able to change shape, and then also safety for human-robot interactions. And so there are a number of applications that have kind of developed over the last 10 years or so. This is one of the, the cuter examples that started with when these soft walking robots had a cool video where a car runs over it and gets right back up and keeps moving, right? It's all soft materials and fluids, and so nothing breaks, right? Which would typically not happen with a hard robot. But then it led to some really interesting biomedical applications. So this is an example of someone who suffers from ALS, and so she has trouble using her hand. And so this is a soft robotic glove that helps her be able to grasp objects that would have been difficult with her ailment. Right? So this is a situation where soft robotics makes a lot of sense. And so there are a number of other situations in which it's been used. Uh, I probably should give a heads up. This is a pig heart. Uh, it's fine, but this is a, a graph, basically, for a pig heart that goes around it. It's a heart sleeve that's able to pump it in a way that's biomimetic. Right? This is something that you definitely want to have to tell you about, like the metal that's pumping your heart. Right? That should freak you out a little bit. But something like this makes sense. And then more recently, there have been a lot of developments in terms of different types of medical devices, such as MRI-compatible medical devices, right? Because these don't have any metals in them. And so they can be MRI-compatible, which has certain benefits. And so it's really kind of burdened into this, this huge field, especially for biomedical applications. And so there are a couple of challenges. And the first challenge that I'm going to mention is this part that often gets hidden in a lot of videos. So when people release their news releases and stuff like that, Usually they try to hide the fact that there's all of these interconnects that are coming off of their robot to control all the different limbs and actuators and different degrees of freedom. Uh, and so that's because basically, so let's say that you have a hand. Using a traditional control scheme, if you have five fingers that you just want to go down in a single direction, you're going to need another five interconnects that connect to that and are each independently controlled. You have 10 fingers, you're going to need 10 of those different controls, right? So this is not a scalable approach. And so one of the ways around this, basically, is something that was very interesting. This is one of my favorite journal papers. And this, was, this came out of the Mies Institute at Harvard. The idea they had was to take a page from the electronics community and take a, instead of an electronic circuit, like an IC, to take a fluidic circuit, right, with analogs to different types of electronic components and embed it directly into a soft robot. And so while this maybe doesn't look like very sophisticated operations, just, you know, the limbs going up and down. This was a major breakthrough in the field to show that you can use a fluidic circuit to control soft robots autonomously, right? So there's nothing connected to this. The problem here is uh, many fold. So one is how you build these types of, of microchips. That's something that I spent most of my PhD doing, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but it's not a fun activity. And then how do you integrate that with the larger soft robot? How do you connect it to all the different limbs? And so in this particular paper, they use a pretty sophisticated strategy to get this all together. So first, they use what's referred to as uh, conventional multi-layer soft lithography. This is going into the microfabrication clean room. And you're building these types of multi-tiered systems and actually manually assembling them afterwards. And you can see here that they even have these little features inside. You have to align every one of these features to one another in three dimensions. If you mess up one of those layers, you got to restart the process. 
And so then after that, they take these, they physically put them in molds, they put uh, different types of materials on top, and they solidify it. And then the fourth step that they're using is a type of reprinting called sacrificial embedded 3D printing, where all the red material that you see here, that orange material, which is really cool in the video, you actually want to get rid of it. And so then they spend another five days just heating this up so all that material evaporates out. Right? So this is a pretty intensive fabrication strategy. It's not something that I personally would ever want to do. I would never want to ask my students to do this. Um, and so the fact is that people are still kind of adapting these in different ways. This is another paper that came out shortly after that, where they're using this multi-layer self-photography approach, and they're actually building a 12-layer system using this approach. And so just to briefly talk about the deficits of this kind of technology, it's going to be very time labor and cost intensive. Uh, I personally did this a lot during graduate school. I can tell you that it's like not enough time. Like you're doing everything for like five minutes. You can't even like watch a Netflix show or anything, you know? So it's just, it's not really that enjoyable. Also it's expensive. So my advisor didn't like it. Um, you can't just walk into a cleaner, right? So, so if you want to be able to even do these processes, one, you need a place where you can do that. You're going to need training. That's going to limit access to this type of technology. Then every single layer has to be aligned under a microscope, typically by hand, or else you have to restart the process. And then lastly, from a geometric perspective, you're always going to be limited to these kind of multiple uh, geometries. And so that's really going to limit the versatility of the type of devices that you can build. So as we go, most of the field has gotten away from that. And there's been the development of a particular component that's had a huge impact. And that is the soft bi-stable glass. This came out of Lord Whiteside's group. That doesn't ring any bells. He's like one of the most famous uh, researchers on the planet, I would say. His age rating is like 200 or something bonkers. Um, but it's a pretty interesting technology. And the way this works is basically that it's able to kind of fluctuate between these two different states. And one of the challenges, though, is that this is typically built by hand, right? So you're going to have to put this all together. Anywhere where you see like there's like a gray material, that's actually glue. So we're gluing these all together. But even with that, we've had a number of really interesting demonstrations of soft robotic functionalities that are able to come out of this, like walking robots and grasping robots and some types of autonomous robots. So if you want to see what is truly the state of the art, this is a paper that came out in the Presidio of the National Academy of Sciences a few weeks ago. And so you can see here, right, these are, you know, fairly kind of like makerspace type operations to be able to build these kinds of robots. Certainly they're great in terms of accessibility, in terms of cost, um, and the operations are actually pretty sophisticated, but they obviously have some, some disadvantages. So one is that all of these, as you can see, are basically being built by hand, right? These are a lot of skills that maybe you learned in elementary school or so forth. How do you cut? How do you glue? Um, and so that's one limitation. With that, though, comes a challenge of repeatability. You know, not just, you know, from person to person, but even for yourself. So on certain days, like, I'm more in the zone and I'm doing a really good job when I'm building something. The next day, I didn't sleep enough or whatever, and then my robot is now working in a different way than it did the day before. Uh, and so on top of that, we also have issues in terms of size. Right? So you your have to build these by hand, you're always going to limit, be limited to how small you can make these kind of systems. And so for my group, our goal when we saw all these kind of approaches was we wanted to see if we could use additive manufacturing or 3D printing, as it's colloquially uh, referred to, to build these types of soft robotic systems with fully integrated fluidic circuitry. Make certain science fiction depictions of what the future is going to look like with 3D printing, all of a sudden, these things become reality. Look at the awesome. It's the world of 3D printing. It's going to change everything. Is the, is the school on today? We're talking limitless customization. As big as the computer was in its day. As the internet was in its day. Printer and any person home, we get down the line of five years. It's funny you can get one. That's for sure. You press one thing, that prints another printer, and it's being old. So, what would you do if you could create anything? Print any object you could imagine. All right, so I'm showing this video not because I believe it, but because I want you to be aware that people try to tell you this, this hyperbole and pretend like it's true. All right, so if this was my class, I would ask everyone, hey, what's the reason that people say silly things like this? Like, it's got to be bigger than the internet was, I'd say. The internet is over, apparently. It's not, it's 
say anymore. Uh, these are very silly statements to make. And so all of these were taken from videos that came out from the circa 2010 to 2013. And so what I'm going to show you here are stock prices associated with many of the major 3D printing companies. And so actually that guy who's telling you about the steam engine, his company is at the top left here. So what you'll see is all this hyperbole that's a bunch of people investing in their companies. And then at some point, you have to report the financial results. And the financial results are not matching with what you're saying about everyone's going to have one in their home and so forth. So there was a massive, massive, massive uh, crash in the 3D printed stock market. And so honestly, it never really recovered, right? So you're not going to really see anything that's much better than this or more like modest, modest uh, improvements. So maybe some of you are thinking, oh, Dr. Sokol, it's happened back in 2013. We're smarter nowadays. And I will say, no, that's not true. Desktop Metal just came out last year. Everyone had all the hoopla about it. Oh, it's going to be the next big thing. Same thing again. Their stock price goes up. This was arguably, the, or I believe it to be the worst performing 3D printing stock of all of last year. And it's uh, never really recovered. This is, you know, the date. Actually, stock price is a little bit lower than what I have it here. All right. And so just be careful about this, right? You have to think about 3D printing like you think about any other type of manufacturing process. All right. You can't use it because it's cool. You have to use it because it has genuine scientific or engineering utility in a particular situation. So I'm going to very quickly give you a couple of rule of thumbs that you can just run up by, you know, in terms of your critical thinking, like, does this make sense? One of them is going to be related to the number, the amount of production volume that you're making with the product. With conventional manufacturing, normally you're going to see something along the lines of this, right? The more product that you're making, the less it's going to cost per part. Additive is weird, though. You know, in theory, there really isn't any benefit of scale with additive because you're going to be putting things in serial on a single print. And so there's no benefit in this. And so essentially what that leads to is this volume break even, that if you're making a very small number of parts, it's likely going to be more financially uh, beneficial to 3D print it. If you're making a lot, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of parts, millions of parts, and you hear some talking about 3D printing, I want you to put on your critical thinking cap and wonder if they're kind of making some stuff up so they can get you to invest in our company. All right. On the other end of things, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to really explain. It's a little bit more abstract. But this is in terms of the complexity of the design, the geometry that you're going to be building with these particular parts. And so here, usually conventional manufacturing, the more sophisticated the design is, the more intricate, the more difficult it's going to be to be able to manufacture. But with additive manufacturing, again, you don't really have that. And so in this particular situation, it's going to kind of cost the same amount no matter what. It's really just the time on the machine and uh, how much material you're using. And there are cases where, honestly, printing something that's an intricate design is going to cost me less money than printing a cube because a cube is going to need more material in certain applications. And so there's essentially this benefit here that's essentially, like if you're making something very sophisticated like this, what we're looking at here is like a complexity break, where if you have a very simple design, you're probably going to go with conventional manufacturing. But there are going to be cases where, at least in my field, there are designs that I wanted to make, like vasculature of the human body that was biomimetic, that there was no way to build it at scale using conventional methods. And that's where additive manufacturing can be beneficial. But this is a little bit more abstract to figure out exactly what those cases are and so forth. So general rules of thumb, you know, try your best to keep things in mind. Uh, keep your mind. So this is the logo for my lab. And it's actually meant to, be, meant to represent the holy trinity of 3D printing technologies that are applicable to the type of, of research that I work on. So there are light-based 3D printing technologies, there are extrusion-based 3D printing technologies, and there are also ancient-based 3D printing technologies. And so in discussing microfluidic circuitry, there are a couple of developments that have come out recently that are related to each of these. For most people, when they hear the term 3D printing, they're usually thinking of something like this. And so, indeed, this is a technology that has been used to make certain types of fluidic circuit components, like vats, right? And they can do them on really interesting surfaces, like on curvilinear surfaces. My group has also done a little bit of research with extrusion-based 3D printing, and certainly there are significant benefits in terms of the material versatility. So basically, if you can extrude a material out of a nozzle and it can maintain its shape afterwards in some way or another, you can 3D print it. Also, pretty inexpensive to build these kind of printers. Uh, so that, that's another benefit there. 
Outside of that, though, they are, are, are really, it's really a terrible strategy on every other level that I would typically consider when making a decision of how I'm going to build something. So the print speed is very slow. And then also the, geom the geometric versatility, because the nozzle tip has to be in that place physically while you're building something, you're really limited in the types of designs you can build, especially at smaller scales. So my was never uses this type of 3D printing. So there are a couple other approaches, and I think light-based 3D printing, at least in the field of fluidic circuitry, is one of the most prominent ways to build those types of components. And so if you're interested in this type of work, I would highly recommend looking into the work of Albert Folk at uh, University of Washington, or Greg Nordeen at BYU. And they use a lot of what's referred to as back photopolymerization processes. So like stereolithography, DLP, LCD, those kind of approaches. I know that I saw that you all have a bunch of those here on campus. It's about five of those form threes uh, over in one of your labs. So you have access to these kind of technologies. Uh, in terms of state of the art, this is a paper that came out about a year ago just showing the scale at which you can build these and the type of sophistication you can get into one of these designs. Again, by just pressing print, and then you have to do a little bit of post-processing to get rid of the fluid inside of those channels. But if you really want to shrink these down to a very small scale, in my view, direct laser writing is the best possible way to do this. And the way that this works is basically you're using a tightly focused bulk laser, and you are scanning it directly inside of a photothermal material. That's a material that's a liquid, but once it gets, gets hit with light, it turns it from a liquid to a solid, essentially. That's a bit of an oversimplification. Right? But what's special about this is that only that single focal point actually cures or solidifies the material. Everything above it, everything below it, stays as a fluid. And so that's really beneficial for a lot of people. So my group has demonstrated the ability to do this in a multi-material format, so multi-material 3D nanoprinting. And one of the benefits is that because you're scanning that laser inside of this, this particular liquid, we can get really fast printing speeds at really amazing scales that are very difficult to achieve. So 100 nanometer is roughly a thousand times smaller than the thickness of the human hair is the scale of which we're doing. So my students have been working on this in a, in a number of different ways. And so I mentioned before that 3D printing doesn't make sense in certain applications, it does in others. With printing with microfluidic devices, most of the microfluidic device, you don't really need that to be printed. And so what my students did was they came up with a strategy where basically you would make a conventional microfluidic device, and then you fully 3D print the structures that absolutely need to be fully three-dimensional, right? So like blood vessels or you know, ship research, that's where 3D printing makes sense. And you can see here, these are examples. And so to give you a sense of scale, the diameter of these vessels is roughly eight microns. That's about the size of a red blood cell. All right, so that's how small we can print the things. And we can also print with different types of materials. And so one of the aspects that our lab has looked into is printing with electrically conductive materials as a pathway to true 3D electronics. But I'm not talking about any of that today. What I'm going to be talking about is basically how we can use these to build microfluidic circuits, as well as soft robotic systems, and then potentially as a pathway to integrate the two simultaneously. So the overall approach something like this. So again, you can start with some type of micro device. This can be conventionally manufactured. And what we're going to do is we're going to fill this with a photo curable material, that liquid phase photo curable material. And we look at the inside of the channel to have that photo the photo curable material right in the center. And then we're going to take our laser and we're going to be scanning the laser point by point, layer by layer, to cure that material and solidify it only in the places that we want to. And so it ends up looking something like this. I'm going to show the real video in a second. And then you're left with your fully 3D component directly printed right inside that channel. And so this is what it looks like in real life. The blue and yellow video, that's just a simulation showing you what you're seeing on the right side. Um, this, the right side can be a little bit hard to understand exactly what's happening in three dimensions. Um, but if you look on the bottom, you can see an SEM image of exactly what that looks like. You'll notice that like the walls of the bellow, that is under is smaller than 100, or sorry, smaller than one like in terms of the thickness there. So really incredible capabilities here. And so in this particular paper, we use it as a way to build a type of valve where it is a normally open valve where fluid can move through it, but if you increase the pressure from one channel, it can close another pathway to stop fluid flow through the device. We've also demonstrated this with other materials. This is an example of a spring diode. And without showing any data of how it behaves, one of these you might notice is on the top, both sides of the diode are inflating because as you increase the 
pressure, basically the material is really flexible. But on the right side, you can see that, or on the bottom, you can see that on the right side, it's going to be expanding. The left part of that is not, because the fluid in the diode is being stopped. So one of the things that we did with this is we thought, hey, can we kind of take this concept and integrate it with soft micro actuators? And so we had this architecture here, and we have these soft micro grippers, basically. So when you inflate them, they close together to like catch a cell or to do something like that. And then we also have what we're referring to as fluidic transistors. All right, so we're using that term very liberally. We did set the precedent. Other groups that are much more powerful than us to call these fluidic transistors. They're really more like triodes, or they're bios in the triode region. But the way that this works is that we have this pretty sophisticated architecture right here. And one of the things that's pretty notable is because of the speed at which you can print with this, we can actually print free floating elements using this type of approach. And then we can also have our fellow microstructure, and then we have this micro post in the center. So the way that this works is that initially a fluid flows in a particular direction, and that ceiling just comes down and it blocks flow through the component. But if you want to, you can apply what we're referring to as a gate pressure at sufficient magnitude that's able to then expand these fellows and open the component to now get fluid that's able to flow through it. And what's interesting is actually the diameter of that structure on top, that disc, the larger it is, the harder it is to open. So you end up needing more pressure to be able to open again based on just a simple geometric quantification of a diameter. And so this is what the printing process looks like. On the top, you can see the, uh, the micro grippers that are being printed. From the bottom, that's actually the fluidic transistor. And then this is an SEM, a colored SEM, just because my student is having some fun, of what the actual micro grippers look like after they've been fabricated. But just note that the green and the yellow, those are all part of the same material. So this is an, an analog of what the circuit is that we're showing here. So you can see there's transistors, there are capacitors. A capacitor is typically the way that we represent fluidic actuators, so it operates somewhat similar to a capacitor. And so initially, we actually have an identical source pressure applied to both of these channels. And then we have a gate pressure that we can control, basically, how high is that pressure. So with a low pressure, basically, it's only enough to be able to actuate that very first transistor and open it so that only the very first set of micro are actually going to close. And if you want to actuate both, you're going to have to keep increasing the pressure up to a high pressure. And then once you do that, now we're finally able to allow fluids to be able to move through that next transistor and open. So kind of a really proof of concept demonstration that you can change just a single pressure. And based on the magnitude, we can actuate different components or have different states just from a single pressure source being tuned. So in general, this is a really good step in the direction we're going with it. But honestly, we're kind of like 3D printing components inside of microchip devices. We're not really building full software stuff, uh, robotic systems the way that we, we wanted to. And so we asked ourselves, is there a pathway to be able to build truly entire soft robotic systems, like everything that we're using with that integrated uh, fluidic circuitry all in a single step? And so to do that, we have to switch to an inkjet-based fluid printing process. And so it looks something like this, and it is very similar to the way that a color printer works. And just like a color printer, where basically you can print different colors next to one another, here we can print different materials next to one another, including sacrificial support materials that are water dissolvable. You can dissolve out of these parts after the process. But unlike a color printer, you don't just do one layer, we're doing layer on top of layer on top of layer more of a line by line, layer by layer process versus others in one layer. So back when I was a postdoc at Berkeley, we definitely demonstrated a couple initial examples of this. And so we showed that we could build fluidic capacitors, which are basically just balloons. We can build fluidic diodes that are able to block fluid flow in one direction, but allow fluid to move in the opposite direction. And then we developed a couple of fluidic transistors. But one of the limitations of this approach was the printer that we were using at the time could really only print one type of material. And so what that led to is we had to have these kind of silly architectures to be able to make one part more flexible than the others, because we had parts that were meant to be dynamic, deformable, and we had other parts that were meant to definitely not do They were deforming, and actually the part was going to be compromised, which was functional. And so one of the things we wanted to do was switch towards multi-material fluid 
And so that's something that a number of my students at the University of Maryland have been working on. And the idea here is basically that you use your CAD software, you design fluidic diodes, you design fluidic transistors, if it pops up, uh, fluid transistors, fluid resistor, which is basically just a channel. You actually don't want the resistance there, but that's the case. It's just a, a channel that's relatively long or very small. We have these capacitors, which are basically our actuators. We have uh, different types of connectors as well. And then we also have body features, right? So again, because the 3D printing, we're not really limited to the types of structure we can make. And then again, in your CAD software, in your computer-aided design software, you combine all of these together into one. And what I'm showing underneath it is, is the fluidic circuit that's embedded inside of this particular system. And then you can take this to your PolyJet 3D printer, and you can print the whole thing all in a single step. And again, you have those compliant or flexible materials, you have those rigid materials, and then the yellow material is a sacrificial support material that you're going to have to get rid of after the printing process. And so there are two components here that I kind of want to just highlight how they operate. So we have a fluidic diode or a fluidic check valve, as well as this particular type of fluidic transistor that looks complicated, but I think the functionality is so bad. And so the fluidic diode is, is relatively simple in its operation. So basically, we have this rigid outer casing. We have this, again, we're using that three voting disc. But because of the multi material versatility, we can actually put a little O-ring directly on top of it to get better sealing. Uh, and then when you apply fluid flow in the forward direction, it's able to sit and it's able to have the fluid bypass the element so you go through the device. But when you reverse the flow rate, it actually brings that particular disc right up and it ends up sealing the flow in the reverse direction. And what's interesting about our result is we found that initially, actually, it doesn't block fluid flow very well. But the higher the, the, the pressure on the opposite end, it actually kind of like forces that O-ring onto the ceiling, and it performs better at higher pressures than it does at lower pressures. Which is kind of interesting. But it makes sense. And so then we also have this normally closed microfluidic transistor. And this is really similar to the, the particular element we already talked about, where basically you have the rigid casing, we have this free-floating disc that, again, it has that O-ring, it also has a micropost on the bottom. And then we have these compliant diaphragms that are connected by a rigid piston. And so initially, when fluid comes in, it's going to stop fluid from moving through it. But if you apply a gate pressure of sufficient magnitude, it can open it. But if you go too high, then actually it can re-block fluid. So basically, you have three states depending on how much uh, fluid pressure you're putting into the system. And so one of the benefits is you can also tune this functionality based on these microposts that you have arrayed around that seal. And so if there's uh, if you actually don't include those, you find you end up getting this very kind of finite performance where you, know, you have fluid coming in as you increase pressure and it drops right off very quickly. But if you make those posts long enough, then you can actually prevent it from reclosing. So once it opens, it stays open for as long as you can keep it. So we combine these together and we use a PolyJet 3D printer. We're using the Connex 500, uh, the Connex 3 Object 500 system from Stratasys. And so for this particular design, it took about eight hours to print. The main thing that changes how long it takes is just the height. The taller something is, the longer it's going to take. The shorter and flatter it is, like if you print a pancake, that's really fast. But if you print like a cube type shape, it's going to take you longer. And then once it comes out, it's completely covered with that support material. And the support material is inside all of the premises. Everything is filled with that support material, including all the fluid channels. So in order to make it easy to be able to remove that, what we did was we, just, we redesigned our components to give ourselves open pathways that we can then stick a rod through and just clear out the channel kind of quickly and then run fluid through it afterwards. So to show what that looks like, first, basically, right when you get it off the print, you take it, and this is one of my uh, former PhD students, and basically he's just cleaning off all the different outer components that we're going to be connecting to. Then we're going to take a Dremel and just basically run it through all those different open uh, spaces, be able to have it go through to make these like kind of fluidic pathways. Then after that, we're going to kind of clean it out a little bit more in terms of the interfaces. And then we're going to connect it with all of these different fluidic tubing that we can then actually, this is a, a flow pump that is just going to run fluid through it to be able to dissolve the support material inside. 
And so for this particular example, it took about 25 minutes of manual labor just to be able to do these four steps. But overall, basically, from pressing start on the 3D printer to having your device that's ready to use that was less than 24 hours, and only about 60 minutes of that was, you know, scraping off the build plate and picking it up and bringing it over to our lab and, and taking those parts off. So not really a lot of, of manual labor. Uh, and also, whenever you print, you, know, you put on any printer, and it should be theoretically identical to whatever you use. And so we were really excited about the operations of the system. As you can see here, this was meant to be very heavily inspired by the Octopus. Right? And so this is something that the reviewers of the journals really wanted to see. You know, if your technology is good, can you also do the octopus functionalities of the up and down oscillations? And that was kind of the first demonstration that we did here. Now, there was something else that we had read in a journal paper a couple years back before this, uh, from again, from that George Whiteside group, where they talked about some of the limitations of conventional microfluidic valves. And they mentioned that it's not very straightforward to be able to have something called gain. And so we thought maybe that's something that we can address using this type of approach. So the last thing I'll be talking about is the idea of these, these gain-based components. And so what we did here is we're really making use of these two different diaphragms that we have in this case. So you'll notice that most of the architecture is pretty similar. You have that rigid casing, got that O-ring again. We then have this rigid piston that connects, connects these two flexible diaphragms. So the way that this operates is, again, initially, you're able to have fluid that's going to come into the device and go right through it. But if you want to stop that fluid, you can apply a gate pressure in this bottom region. These are completely isolated regions apart from that connecting piston. And what's interesting about this is this will lead to a force balance on that, that central piston. And that's going to be related to the pressure times the area in these two different quadrants. And so one of the things that is great about 3D printing is we can easily design in CAD what are going to be the sizes of these different diaphragms. And so you'll note that the top diaphragm is much smaller than the bottom diaphragm. And so because of that, even if the pressure on the bottom diaphragm is larger, or sorry, is, uh, is lower than the pressure on the top diaphragm, then that lower pressure is able to overcome it and actually still close it. And this idea of a smaller input being able to overcome a larger input is referred to as pressure gain in this type of situation. And so this is just showing you some examples of what this looks like in practice. So the top region of all of these is identical. The only thing that we're changing in these simulations is the size of the bottom region. And so you'll see that as we increase the pressure, first the, the largest diaphragm is gonna have it close first, then the middle one, and you need a lot more pressure to get that one that's the one to one ratio to be able to close. But then you can integrate these with soft actuators. And here it's designed to look like a finger. And what you can do is that initially you have fluid that's able to come through or air pressure. And you can close that gate at a certain pressure. And then the fluid has nowhere else to go but right into those knuckle features to get it to the back. And so this is what it looks like once it's been printed. This is what it looks like once it's been printed. Uh, and you can see what we're going to be doing is the, the source pressure is identical. And all we're going to be doing is just increasing the gate pressure. And we put a little pin wipe, like a little tissue paper, right at the outlet. So you can kind of see that initially it's uh, you know, not really flowing too much. But as you end up closing the gate, or sorry, it is, uh, it is flowing a lot. But as you close the gate, now fluid is not really coming out. There's no air coming out. And it stops being blown. And you can see that the, the, um, at the finger ends up bending this way. And so what's cool about this is basically you can get different forces for your fingers at different gate pressures, depending on which of those types of transistors, how large that diaphragm is in the bottom, that's connected. So we had a little fun with this concept. We decided to make uh, a type of, of software on a hand if you will. And it has these different transistors. And so the way that this works is that we have a consistent source pressure that's coming in. So initially, if you're trying to play with a, a conventional Nintendo controller, then if there is no fluid pressure in terms of the gate, nothing happens. But if you apply a low gate pressure, it's enough to actuate that very first finger, which leads, if you're playing Mario, now you're able to move to the right. If you increase a little bit more, now he's actually running. So before he was walking, now he's running if you press that B button. And then finally, if you go to a high pressure, he's able to jump. 
And so we combined them all together and we printed this in a single step. Again, I mentioned that height is a differentiator. So this one prints on the order of about three to three and a half hours, but definitely under four hours. And then afterwards, after you process it, you end up with something like this. It's obviously a prettier picture of it, but it's something like that. And so this is a demonstration of using this technology. And so what you're going to see is in the blue box, what I've done is I had my students record everything from this experiment. So we have a live reading of what are the pressures that are being delivered into the actual uh, thing, basically into the hand. We then have a constant source pressure, and then it's that gate pressure that we're going to have. So again, that's constant, and we're going to have this gate pressure that's going to be increasing from off to low to medium to high. And you're going to watch what happens with the hand and also the margin. So if you want to watch the full 90 second video, just you can read the paper, but I'm not gonna make you sit through that. Um, it works, I mean, beat the level, but I personally, I, can, I know I can beat Mark much faster than I ever can here. But still a very important demonstration. Another part that I wanna emphasize is that all of the fluidic circuit components, body features, everything that you saw from this paper and today, you are available to download them for free through our GitHub, right? I originally had this GitHub as part of our paper. I don't know why, Remove the link to the external site. So people read a little bit weird and say, hey, we're offering all the components for free. And then it's like, it's nowhere to be found. But it's here and, and just send me an email if you can't find it. All right, so a couple of questions I typically get, I'll just address initially, is why did you choose Super Mario Brothers as the demo for this, this type of world? All right, so for those in the software box field, there is a particular demo that everyone loves to use. People love to play piano with their soccer bikes. Uh, so, right? That is the standard. It's classy. People know about pianos. It gets used a lot. I have certain I have certain general general issues in terms of these types of demos, which is why we have them. So there's two issues in my opinion. No meaningful penalties if you make mistakes, right? If you make a mistake, yeah, it sounds a little bit bad or whatever. It doesn't really make that much of a difference in terms of the demo. I think you get it, right? So the tempo, you can just set it based on what you think you need. So there's a number of things that I really like about Mario. So one is that this is an unforgiving game, right? So I don't know how many times you played Mario, but we lost a lot when we first started trying to develop this, right? If you don't press the button at the right time, if you don't jump, you're gonna fall right down a pit. You're gonna run into an enemy. If you press a button, but you don't let go of that button, right? If you're trying to run, you need to stop, you don't run into a good button, then you're gonna fail. So it's really easy to lose at this particular game. And then also one of the things that I like about it is that the level design, everyone, I think most everyone has seen Mario at some point in their life. You know that, that I'm not making this any different than it is, right? So one of the other things about the, the particular um, video that I have my students record is I wanted like the time on the bottom so people could see that I didn't like, hack the game to make it slower or incredibly slow or easier, that it has a very specific amount of time that it takes to accomplish the level. And so mind you, I felt that this was a really high level of difficulty. Unfortunately, viewers hated this. They really did not like this. Uh, and so I had to spend a lot of my, my rebuttals of my papers defending my choice of Mario, which I thought they would be so enamored with the, the ability to do these sophisticated operations, but did not sell them better. It's not classy like a piano. So it happens. All right, so a lot of another question I get is, all right, you played you know, Mario with hand, what's it good? A lot of the demonstrations that you know, we initially do in academia, you have to demonstrate proof of principle, right? You can't just get straight to the application. That takes many times, years upon years. For some of the stuff that we do in the medical community, we're talking five to 10 years for some type of application. And you need to build out the novel belief that you can do that. 
And so currently we're working on kind of leveraging this technology for a particular area of developing microcatheters for neurosurgery and cardiovascular surgery for children. And so there are a couple of challenges with conventional microcatheters. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but basically that there are challenges in terms of being able to maneuver it. So imagine that you're trying to perform neurosurgery, but you can't directly steer your catheter. So you're basically just taking this, this essentially like a, a tubing and rod and just putting it inside someone's vasculature and trying to just spin it and push and hope that it ends up in a particular part of your brain, right? So that's really hard. This leads to a lot of complications. And also, most of these are not MRI compatible. They're all just steerable types of microcatheters, but they're made using metals that are obviously incredibly dangerous with MRI. But MRI is great in terms of safety, and also you get a ton of visual information. And so this is something that some neurosurgeons kind of came to us and said, hey, we have these problems. Can you do anything about it? And I said, watch Mario. And so that ended up leading to us writing a proposal together, which I still write. <laughs> so, so we wrote a proposal, and it's ended up getting funded uh, by NIH. And so we just had this project a couple months ago. But it's really exciting because we're basically, you know, using 3D nanoprinting and these soft robotic principles and these different actuation schemes, just a little bit differently in terms of the steering capability to build these new types of neurosurgical microcatheters. We're also attacking to see if we can basically leverage this for surgery with, with young children, like neonates with the Children's National Hospital, because that's also a case where you have very delicate vasculature, it's very small. So navigating in that also can be very dangerous. So, so those are some of the more, uh, I would say, relevant applications apart from just playing a video game with uh, a robotic game. And so uh, I know there are a number of students in this audience, and so this is something that I wish that more uh, professors kind of openly talked about, but all you're seeing here are like, the good things that happened to me like these last couple of years. Like you're not seeing like all the, the stress and the pain that went into this. So I'm gonna share with you some reviews of my paper, the papers that you've just seen. So this is a paper that basically said that our, our work was unpublishable and that really it was maybe suitable for a conference and that's pretty much it. And then it ended up on the cover of Science Advances. And so again, just, you know, you just have to take these things in stride. And again, this is right before my you know, case is about to go up. I'm very nervous. I'm getting reviews like this. It can really hit you a certain way. Uh, this is another one. So someone told us that, that our manuscript uh, was, uh, was very bad written. Um, but then, uh, you know, after we submitted it, the journal selected it for their, their early career award, specifically saying that it was an outstanding paper. And so I claim, in fact, it is very good written. So just know that you're only seeing the good stuff. There was a lot of struggles and very hard times and lots of high blood pressure leading to a lot of stuff from yourself. So in conclusion, we had a couple different strategies for integrating lytic circuits and soft robotic systems together at different scales. We had this in-situ direct laser writing approach where we can have these 3D nanoprinted components and we demonstrated that we can basically use a gate pressure of varying magnitude to control different states. And we did that also at slightly larger scales with being able to print you know, essentially entire soft robotic systems in a single step. And again, we were able to show we can use this with these Mario programs. And so I want to thank all of the different uh, funding sponsors who supported various aspects of this work and my path. Uh, and with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for the great Before I ask the question, I ask the community. Organize the stuff, please come and join me on the stage. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Any questions for our speaker? So, thank you for the intro 3D project. Where is that actually material coming from? Is it just etching and is it in the air and it combines with the fire? So so basically uh the easiest way to explain would be you have like a glass slide and you just take like a tiny pipe head, you put one drum onto your onto your slide, and then the laser is beneath it, and then this laser can go through the glass and it can basically scan anywhere inside. Yeah, 
when it comes to Mario, what control system did you use for that? Did you just have a researcher like mining controllers or dummy controllers? Uh, are you familiar with like the um uh what do they call it? Like the tool assistant speedrun community? No. All right, so basically there is this whole all right, so there's like the speedrunning community, which is like how fast can you complete a certain level of a video game in the whole game. And there's a special way to do it where you can just program your computer to just type in buttons. And so for ours, what we did was instead of just typing in the buttons directly, we had our computer programs run a script where we just input pressures, input low pressure, input medium pressure, high pressure at certain times, and then we just walk away and let it go. Yeah, so like in that blue box, that's what you're saying. It's just one of the computer talking. But yeah, there's no um, manual touching of the turn. Hello, uh, thank you again for coming all the way out here to uh, Toledo. A very inspiring talk, very fun to see. Um, I have another Mario related question. And I think there's another reason you must have chosen it. Maybe you haven't had time to this set. Right, I think as you increase your game record, you're pressing one button, and then two at a time, and then three at a time. And it just happens that Mario is a game you can play that way, right? Yeah, yeah. But you're doing circuitry, and surely there's a way to develop that circuitry. So as you increase the pressure, maybe your finger can off on the buttons. And so how much more complicated are the circuits you need to build to make that kind of functionality happen so that you know you can get all eight different states with three buttons through one pressure? Yes, I mean, you basically have to make a type of course. And so you can actually see in the paper, we started to kind of um, carve out the pathway to that. So um, do you remember for the, for, the, for the terminal that goes up and down, we use normally closed fluidic transistors? So you need to basically use a combination of normally closed and normally open. Although, to be honest, you could probably do it with some version of the normally closed. Um, but they have to have different gate regions. You saw uh, that all the normally closed ones that we had, it was identical top and bottom. So we just didn't get to it. That was around COVID times. And so basically one of the next things we're looking at is can we get that to have different states? Um, the other reason was also because with the current version that we had, the students came to me and like, look, Dr. Sobel, we're gonna do CLs on the piano. And they're like, da, 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 da. I'm like, that sucks. Like, I can't present that. It's gonna be terrible. And um, I was playing, uh, Mario, and I was like, we can do it. So I came into my lab and I was like, I want to see you guys play Mario. I was like, Cruise. But they did it. And so I just did a lot more. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you. Yeah. 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 Happens, or is there any time to program don't work correctly? Yeah, I mean, so honestly, the hardest part about doing that was our pressure system, you know. So I don't know if you like how close you're watching the pressure graph, but uh, so our pressure system is, I feel, it's expensive, it's a thirty thousand dollar system, but still, there's roughly a one second plus or minus for every input that you give it. So the issue wasn't for like the hand. It was our pressure system. If you run that 10 times, you'll never get the same functionality. You know, it's supposed to hit it here and it ends up hitting it here. And in Mario, it can't be forgiving. So it's a little bit of a play. So, yeah, the biggest challenge, honestly, was just the pressure system. Oh, actually, yes. do you think any of these developments will lead to any patents? Uh, so, so the soft robotic. Microcatheter that we're working on. Uh, that one we are looking into patenting and then also launching a company based on the function. Um, so there just simply aren't a lot of pathways. It's basically steerable microcatheters that are MRI compatible at this scale. It's just not something that, that's really feasible for other approaches. And so, especially in a repeatable fashion, is so that something that, that we are we're basically leveraging our NIH R01 to demonstrate that it works well in terms of neurosurgery with mice. And then we have to kind of be strategic in terms of when we decide to get a path. But hopefully, like in 10 years' time, like you'll see a company based on it. But then it's another, for like FDA, it'll probably be another 15, 20 years until it's an actual product. But that's medical devices. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Oh, I think you can turn it off, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. I think yeah. Okay. So sorry about that, but uh, anyway, I was wondering if the application was a kind of viscosity of the fluids that comes through, like the component. I would imagine it might be smoother, but it probably depends on application too. Yeah, I mean, it really depends. I mean, so for most of so the hand demonstration actually was just air pressure. So we did that fully pneumatic, whereas for the um like the, the turtle. That was actually two fluids. We were just using fluid, like uh, fluid pumps, to just push it in, switch pumps. Um, there were some really interesting demonstrations from other groups where they use like different viscosities of different fluids to get this type of like sequential behavior. So one of the other prominent examples is one where like you have four limbs and it goes like one, two, three, four, um, and they just demonstrate that by using fluidic viscosity as a pattern. Yeah, so that's definitely another kind of approach. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Um, more questions? Uh, yes, one well, final question, maybe. So, what's the highest pressure threshold that your entire system can have in regards to the material you're discussing as a different? I mean, it depends on, but I mean, basically, it depends on how you're going to build it. So we were going for very like lower applications. I think everything we did was maybe less than two bar. Our whole building can only go up to about six to seven bar, but that changes on a day, on, you know, on a given day. Um, but it, again, it really just depends on on how much you need data. But, but if you make some of the parts like a little bit thicker, you can easily go up to like six or seven bar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, let's uh, give another round of applause.